good to have everybody with us this evening. I appreciate everybody coming out, and we thank you folks that are watching on Facebook. And uh, I really don't know how to get started tonight, because I'm doing this differently than maybe any sermon I've ever done before in all the years I've preached. So I kind of want to start it out by saying this, that I am not a wordsmith, okay? Thank God I can read, and I have a lot of reference materials to go to, but I was never known as a scholar. My wife went through grade school, high school, and into college, made straight A's, never made a B. I did all that stuff too, and very seldom made a B also. So <laughs> anyway, bear with me because uh, I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you tonight. I hope you're one of those folks that have a notebook and take a, a lot of uh, notes because if you don't, you may lose part of this. So, and I will tell you this, we're going to begin in 2 Kings chapter 20, and we're going to act, end in Acts chapter 12, but we're going to journey a long ways going through there. If I came to you tonight and asked you, what is the ultimate form of worship? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? The songs we've just sing, the songs we've just sung, the things we've just seen, sermons, whatever. <laughs> By every definition that I can find, especially in the Greek definitions, the ultimate form of worship is prayer. And we as a church have decided to be a praying church. We have a Monday night prayer time. I hope you come and are a part of that. It's an hour of just you and God quietly going vertical, worshiping with one, worshiping him in a very intimate setting. So as I was thinking about that, I, I thought, well, let's just, take, let's just take some time and go through the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about prayer. So I would like to begin, as always, with, with a prayer, and then we'll get into God's Word and see what it says. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace. And Lord, I do pray that your people will be blessed by the hearing of your word tonight. I know, Lord, this study has blessed me as I have worked on it all these several days and weeks. And, Father, I pray that uh, we'll come away tonight with a renewed sense of what it means to be a praying people. And we'll see in your word what prayer has done for people over the, over the ages, almost since the dawning of time. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for your presence here tonight and in us and us in you. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Second Kings chapter 20 tells us the story of King Hezekiah. And I'm going to be reading uh, from the uh, King James Version, and I know some of you don't particularly like that, but uh, bear with me and we'll get through it together. 2 Kings chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and saith unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out of the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day thou shalt go into the house of the Lord. And I will add unto, the, unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. So Hezekiah had been the king, served God, served God with all of his heart, did everything that God had told him to do to the very best of his ability. And Isaiah, the prophet of the Lord, who is at the people at this time, come to him and, comes to him and says, Hezekiah, God says your days on this earth are over. You're going to die. Do you know that's an appointment we'll all keep? And we'll all keep it on time. If you are like our son, he is perpetually late for everything and has been since forever. 
But that's one appointment everybody keeps and keeps on time. And Hezekiah, brokenhearted, goes before the Lord and says, Lord, I've tried to do what you have called me to do every day of my life. And Isaiah's left. He's come and delivered his message and left. And he's going back. He's going home. He's going out of the courtyard. And uh, all of a sudden, God speaks and says, you know what, Isaiah? I've heard Hezekiah's prayer. It's heartfelt. He means it. And I want to reward him. And he says, turn around and go back. Back and tell him he's going to live another 15 years. Praise God. You know that? So many times we hear from people that, well, the doctor says that you're terminal and whatever and all this is going away. You know what? I don't know in the hospitals I've, as I've visited people and with people that said they were terminal, I have ever seen an expiration date stamped on the body, bottom of somebody's foot. We will live as long as God des desires us to live. And if we are servants of the Lord, there's a chance he'll add more days to us. Never know what's going to happen. Hezekiah prayed, guys. You know, it, it, that prayer of Hezekiah was a springboard to going into the church, into the, it says here, we went into the synagogue to worship. Prayer prepares God's people to really worship him. Did you know that? The other night here, we had the best crowd we've ever had on a Monday night. I don't know if you were here or not, but you know what? There was a different attitude. There was, a def there was definitely a different prevailing attitude in this church that entire week, I believe. Things changed. It was awesome. We need that every week. We need that group every week. We need that group and more. So... That's what I really want to deal with tonight is how God answers prayer and how prayers have been answered by, for so many people in so many other ways. Turn back a few pages if you're following me in the Bible to 1 Kings chapter 17. And I'm old and slow, so give me a minute and I'll get where, where I want to go. 1 Kings chapter 17. Yeah, and I'm bad about that. Uh, they tell me I give the scripture and don't give you time to get there. So if you don't hear what I say, please say, what did you say? So I can, I can help you out. 1 Kings chapter 17. And this is about Elijah, who was God's servant. 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, verse 1 says, and Elisha the Tishbite, who was of, of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, and let me stop there just a minute, because Ahab was a very evil king. Ahab did everything God didn't want him to do. Ahab thought he was all-powerful, and he was just absolutely in charge no matter what. If Ahab said it, that's all that happened. Nothing else was going to happen. And he married probably the most wicked woman in the Bible, Jezebel. And so we had a in other words, what I'm saying is Elijah wasn't living in a time when everything was good and wonderful and perfect. He was living in a time when times were tough. So he goes to Ahab, continuing on, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these, these years, but according to my word. It's kind of bold to stand before the king who is controlling pretty much everything, at least he thinks he is, and tell him, you know what? It's going to quit raining. Your crops are going to fail. And it's not going to rain until I ask God and he allows it to happen again. You really think Ahab believed that when it started? No. Absolutely not. And I love this story as we go on. Look down, uh, go over a little bit in 1 Kings. Go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to be in verses 43 through 46. Now, it hasn't rained for three years, three and a half years. And Elijah's been through a lot of tests. He has uh, 
seen the woman's son healed. He has come against the 450 prophets of Baal. Elijah's been through a lot. And finally, God says it's time for it to rain. I'm actually going to start in verse 41 of chapter 18. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. And Abraham went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went to the top of, the, of Caramel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. In other words, he was praying. And then he says to his servant, now he's already told Ahab, it's going to rain, get ready. So you would think there would be dark skies and foreboding and imminent rain, right? Would make sense. Verse 43, Elijah says to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and says, there's nothing. Blue skies, sunny day, it is beautiful. And he says, go again seven times. I always wondered what the servant must have thought. I've been out there. I've been out there. The sky is beautiful. Nothing's happening. Why am I going out there again? But obedient servant, he goes back and he goes back and he goes back and he goes back seven times. And finally, he comes out in verse 44 and it says, that it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he says, and go up and say unto Abraham, prepare, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. So the servant goes out and says, there's a tiny little sky. There's a tiny little cloud, rather, coming up way out there in the sky. And so Elijah goes and tells Ahab, if you want to get out of here before it just floods and you can't move, you better go now. You know, it's kind of hard sometimes to pray when you don't see anything happening. But if you go on in this story, it says it came to pass that while the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went into Jezreel. God's word in James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, says that Elijah was a man like us. He had all the same problems. He had all the same lusts. He had all the same troubles. But he became, he was God's servant, and he came before God, and he said, God, you've told me to pray for it not to rain, and it didn't for three and a half years. And then he came back before God and said, God, can it rain now? And God gave him the answer to his prayer, and it rained. That's awesome, guys. You realize how, you realize how that must have affected people as a whole? Didn't really help Ahab any, because he was who he was. But when we see that kind of stuff, it totally amazes me in God's word. Have you ever prayed and wonder if God hears? Really? More than once? A couple of times. Well, <laughs> lots, lots. I want to give you some scriptures. I'm not going to all of them. But the psalmist, and we most know David wrote most of the psalms. And the word says David was a man, David was a man after God's own heart. Psalm 55, 1 David says, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. He also prayed that same prayer in Psalm 61, 1, Psalm 64, 1, and Psalms 88, 2. So David, man after God's own heart, is always asking, God, are you hear my prayer? God, can you hear my prayer? Did you ever ask that, ever ask that question yourself? God, have you heard my prayer? God, have you heard my prayer? Well, the Bible, God doesn't leave us hanging. And that is so good that God doesn't leave us hanging. Because he promises us. In the uh, Psalm 66, verses 19 through 20. But verily, or truly, God hath heard me, and he hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. 
You see, we question, but God always hears, and God always answers. And we kid, Marty and I kid a lot of times about the answers to prayer. You all heard that, right? Everybody says there's more than one answer to prayer. There's yes, there's no, maybe or wait. And the fourth one Marty and I kid about is you've got to be kidding. You really, that, do you really think that's what you want? I, I tell people this, though, imagine what would happen if God answered every prayer you ever prayed just the way you ask him to do. Yeah. Life would have been different, wouldn't it? And it wouldn't have been nearly as good. God is to, totally into prayer, the prayers of his people. I told you I was going to throw a lot of scripture at you. Y'all aren't tired of it yet, are you? No. Okay, good, because there's more coming. Daniel. Love Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, and let me lay out a little scenario here about Daniel. Daniel, of course, we know was part of the captivity and brought into Babylon and he prospered so much, and he, he grew uh, in favor with the, with the king, and Daniel just had a great life going. And you know this? Because this is, this is nice, and it's informal. There's not a lot of us here. I can ask questions like this. Other than Jesus, how many people does the Bible impute no sin to? Hmm? Anybody want to take a guess? Enoch and Daniel. Only, now, it isn't that they didn't sin. Get me that, get you there. They weren't, they were sinless people, but they lived a life so centered in Jesus Christ that he just looked at what they were doing. He looked at their servitude. He looked at their faith. He looked at what he want, at, 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 at what they wanted him to see. So they weren't sinless, but Daniel was really sold on, servicing God, on serving God. So King Darius set forth this decree that nobody could pray for 30 days except in his name. If you were going to pray during that time in that nation, you had to pray in the name of King Darius. King Darius thought he was all in charge, all, in charge, all that in a bag of chips. And so Daniel was in the habit of praying every day. But he prayed to the one and only true God. So Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that he, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did aforetime. In other words, he didn't change. It would have been real easy for Daniel to go in and close the curtain so nobody could see him. But he always prayed prior to that visibly. So everybody knew that he loved God and he prayed to God. And Darius has just said, if you pray to anything besides me, you're dead. I'm going to have you killed. And Daniel, being the strong man of God he was, said, no, uh -uh. I am going to continue to do what I do. I'm going to serve my Lord. I'm going to continue to lift up my Lord in prayer. And he did that three times a day, every day. And guess what? He got caught. And he got thrown in a lion's den. And Darius, who wasn't too happy he'd made the decree to begin with, probably didn't sleep a week that night. I got a feeling Daniel laid down next to the lions and they all had a good night's rest. Darius came out the next day and said, Daniel, are you all right? And uh, Daniel said, yes, Lord. My Lord has shut the, uh, the lion's mouth and I am fine. Wow. Imagine what would happen if we prayed all day, every day for God's will and when the adverse, adversity comes, and it will, when the adversity comes, guess what? 
We're already grounded. We're already there in prayer. We're already knowing that God is going to deliver us and take care of us. One more Old Testament scripture for you. All right, where'd you go? The book of Jonah. Y'all remember Jonah, right? Yo, Jonah. And we know the story of Jonah. Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh and to preach to the people there. And Jonah decided, I'm going the other way because I don't want any part of this. This is not something I want to be involved in. This is not good for me. I'm out of here. And, of course, he takes a ride on the boat, and the storm arises, and he, the captain says, what have we done? Why is God after us this way? And Jonah confesses that I did it, and they pitch him overboard. And God makes this great fish come along. Now, I don't know what kind of fish it was, so... You know, we talk about whales or whatever. But anyway, it was a fish big enough to swallow a man. So Jonah's in the belly of this fish and still alive. That's amazing, if nothing else. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord God out of the fish's belly. You ever prayed when things were really wrong? When things were pretty tough? Well, I got news for you. I don't think it gets much tougher than being inside the belly of a great fish. Can't be a very nice environment. Got to be pretty nasty. And so Jonah, it, it completely, everything's come undone. And he says, Lord, I need you. I need you. Verse 10 of that same chapter, and the way the King James put it is, is pretty blunt. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So the fish comes up and spits Jonah out, and he goes into Nineveh, and people start getting saved. Great revival. Great revival. Oh, how our country needs a great revival today. But you know what? The revival in Nineveh began when Jonah prayed from the belly of of the whale. We want to see revival in Leesburg, Florida. Hopefully none of us are going to get swallowed by a great fish. But that revival is going to begin when we begin to pray that God will deliver us from whatever we're fighting so we can bring the word to Leesburg, Florida. It's what we need, guys. It's what we need. So, our Lord Jesus modeled prayer all of his life. So we're going to go to the New Testament if you're following along with me, and I hope you are. And if you aren't following along with me, I hope you're taking notes so you can go back and check me out. Because as Moses and I both say, always do that. Go back, go back and check us out. Make, make sure what I tell you is true. Because guess what? I'm fallible. I make mistakes. I don't do everything right but I'm trying to share with you the truth of the Word of God. And so go back, look at it, study it yourself, see what it says. Jesus, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And this is just before he comes walking on the water to the disciples. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. When the evening was come, he was there all alone. Do, do, do. Yeah, when the evening come, he's there all alone. You know, it's kind of interesting to me. It's hard to get people to come to pray for one hour. And Jesus was there and prayed all night long. Wow. He had power to walk on the water. He had power to do whatever God called him to do, but you know what? He prefaced it with prayer every time. You look through the, the, all the scripture, and we're going to give you quite a bit here, but he prefaced it with prayer from the beginning all the way through. Prayed all night long before he went down and delivered the disciples that were uh, 
fighting the waves. There's a story told in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel about a boy who was demon-possessed. And his disciples tried to deliver this young man. They did their best to cast the demon out and couldn't. And the father comes to Jesus and he said, your disciples tried to rid my son of this demon, but they couldn't do it. And so Jesus prayed, and guess what? The demon was gone. The boy was delivered. And the disciples come to him and say, how come we couldn't? We believe. We're your disciples. We understand how this works. We know what it's all about. And Jesus answers them. Well, let's go to, to, to verse 20 of Matthew 17. Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it will remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. I want to challenge you. Have you ever fasted? It's a great time. It really is. And when we take time to, to deny self and get into the idea of, Lord, I'm going to fast unto you. I'm going to deny myself so you can do something amazing through me and then get in our prayer closet and begin to really beseech the will of God through the power of the Holy Spirit because we are in Jesus Christ. Great things happen. Did you know that? Great things happen. Demons have to flee. Demons have to flee. And, and I don't, I probably shouldn't go here, but I'm going to. I, I'm not that person who believes that we command things to happen. But I am that person to believe that God commands things to happen. And I am that person that believes that when we are doing our best to allow him to take over and him to take part and him to be the guiding force that he'll let things happen that we have no control over. We can just say, thank you, Jesus, for allowing what you've allowed to happen. Do you know Jesus made prayer requests? Did you ever think about that? Let me show you one of Jesus' prayer requests. And I, I, this is... Uh, Kind of interesting to me. Matthew 9, 38. So what do you think Jesus would make as a prayer request? Well, Jesus is talking about his compassion here in the ninth chapter of Matthew. And he says in verse 36, but he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And here comes a prayer request, verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Wow. Did you ever think about Jesus making a prayer request? Huh? Have you made prayer requests? Absolutely. What did you pray? What did you make prayer requests about? Something that was on your heart. Something that needed change. Something you really desired to have happen. And Jesus has just made requests here. Send laborers. Send helpers. Send the people who will be able to do what needs to be done. A couple of more scriptures I want to share with you. Most people can call commonly the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 19, 9 through 13. I don't particularly look at that as the Lord's Prayer. I believe that the prayer the Lord actually uttered that is so important is actually pretty much the whole 17th chapter of the book of John. Go to John 17, you'll find a lot of things that God, that, that God the Son, Jesus prays about. 
But I picked out two verses I thought were particularly interesting. John 17, verse 15. And he's talking about his disciples here and the people here he is bringing along. And he says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but you should keep them from evil. So Jesus is saying, you know what? I don't pray they should never have any trouble. I just pray you'll keep them in the right frame. I pray you'll keep them away from the evil that comes from the world. I pray you'll equip them to be everything that I've called them to be. I pray, Lord, that you will take care of these disciples. And you know what he did? And that was over 2,000 years ago. And you know what? We're here because those disciples were in the world. They had trouble, but they did what they were called to do. And then look at verse 20 of chapter 17 of the book of John. This is so fantastic because this is about you. This is about us. Did you know Jesus prayed for you? Verse 20 of 17th chapter. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Believe, believers, people that will believe through the word of the disciples. And he goes on, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. They also may be in, one in us that the world may believe thou hast sent me. So years ago, before he ever went to the cross, Jesus was praying for you and me to be in him and to be lights to the world. And it is not an accident that you are where you are right now in this time of your life. Jesus knew exactly who you are, and he knew exactly when you were going to be here, and he was praying for you way back when that you would be everything he's called you to be. I would be everything he's called me to be in Central Florida in 2019. Wow. Now, if we can't get excited about that, we just can't get excited. I mean, come on. Jesus prayed for us, folks. You know how important it is that Jesus prays for us? More important than we understand. Luke's gospel. The 22nd chapter of Luke. And this is kind of scary. Luke 22, verse 31. And let me set a little bit of the scenario here. It, it's Passover meal. And the disciples being human and doing as we humans do have just had a great debate and a great discussion about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And so they're, they're deciding who's going to be great and who's not going to be great. And when you begin to feel that way and you begin to think that uh, you're all that or I'm all that or we're important, and I'm sure Peter probably felt that way. And look what verse 31 of Luke 22 says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, who was Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Wow. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Satan cannot do a thing that God will not allow him to do. But Satan will come against a believer who is being productive for Jesus Christ. He said, I, he said Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. He's going to find out what makes you tick. He is going to come against you. And of course, if you, if you probably read the story of I don't know how many times, but, of course, Peter says, not me, Lord. I'll go with you to death. I'm with you all the way. And Jesus said, you know what? Before morning, you'll have denied me three times. And he did. And he did. Guys, it is so important that we always, always give Jesus the glory and always give Jesus the honor for whatever strength we have. Because when you and I decide we're going to do it in our own selves, look out. Satan's going to ask to sift you like wheat and just show you how weak we are. But 
Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays for us. That is so, so awesome to me. That is just so awesome to me. And I hope it's so awesome to you. Then if we go on a little further, I hope you aren't getting tired yet. The apostles. You know, think about the apostles. They were after Judas was gone and they chose the Matthias. They were 12 guys. Just 12 regular guys. Called of the Lord to do great things. And here we are all these years later and as Moses has alluded to so many times, millions have been saved because of the words of 12 guys that God called to do great things. You know what? We're at least double that number here tonight. I wonder what God would do if we really got sold out and we really became prayer warriors. Acts 16, 13 says that they were gathered together on the Sabbath. This is interesting. Sabbath should have been in a synagogue, right? And went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake with the women there and resorted there. In other words, take prayer where it needs to be. It can't always be in here. Sometimes we need to go where the people are and lift them up in prayer. I don't ever want to use the pulpit to be self-building. But I'll tell you something that Marty and I do every once in a while. You may want to try it because it really sometimes has some interesting ramifications. We eat out periodically, usually more than I want to, but we eat out periodically. And as the Holy Spirit moves, and I'm, I'm telling you, it, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move you to do something, don't do it. If you're doing it just because, well, it sounds like the thing to do, leave it alone because it'll backfire on you. But if the Holy Spirit moves you to do something, do what the Holy Spirit says. And so every once in a while as the Spirit moves, the servers will come up to us and, and they'll be taking our order and whatever. And, and I'll say, I, oh, I have a question. They go, what's that? I said, we're going to ask a blessing on this meal in just a moment. Is there anything in your life we can pray for you about? We've actually had, and Marty will testify, we've had servers sit down and begin to cry just because their day was going that horrible and somebody said, can I pray for you? Guys, when you do, you know when you do that, when you, when you say to somebody, I want to pray for you, you are saying you're important to me. What happens to you matters to me. And I want to challenge you one other thing, too. Every once in a while when you're in church or you're somewhere and somebody says, this is going on in their life, and boy, it's rough, and I don't know how to deal with it, and it's a tough time, and you say, well, I will pray for you, do it. And preferably, do it right then. It's not do you any, it doesn't do them, but you or, them or you any good to say, I'll pray for you and walk off and forget about it. Pray for the people that God puts in your path. Now, just because we've prayed about something doesn't mean it's going to come about just the way we want it to come about. You're still in Acts, I hope, in the 16th chapter. Let's look at verse, well, let's, let's start in verse 4. The disciples are going through the world. Chapter 16, verse 4, and as they went through the cities, they delivered uh, them the decrees for to keep that they were ordained of the apostles and the elders that were at Jerusalem. So they're going through and they're, they're bringing uh, the word and they're bringing the word in the uh, auspices and the power of the church. And verse 5 said, and so the churches were established in faith and increased in number daily. Hey, great ministry, right? They're going through the land. They're preaching. They've been sent by their, uh, by their peers. People are getting saved. The churches are growing. Sounds great, right? And then verse 6 says, Now when they are going throughout Phygera and the region of Gal Galatia the, and were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Excuse me? Forbidden to preach the word? 
Wow. But when the Holy Spirit's directing, he knows, as if you've been around the vertical study any, he knows where the red apples are as compared to where those that are, going, that are unpickable may be. And so there, can you imagine how it must have felt to be, man, this is great. We're going into these cities one after the other, and people are getting saved, and it's fantastic, and the church is growing. And, man, this is a wonderful, wonderful time to be in God's service. And the Holy Spirit says, you can't go there and preach. I don't know about you, I don't know about you, Moses, but I'd have been going, say, what? What do you mean I can't go there and preach? But God always has a plan. God always has a plan. In verse 9, it says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed. Wow, there it is again. Saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And so there the church was launched in an entire different direction. And the church began to grow in a completely different manner. Preceded by prayer. Now, if you're taking notes, I'm not going to go here in this next couple, but I just want to share with you. Ephesians 6.18 says we are to pray for the ability to be strong all the time. You want more strength? Pray, for, pray more. Philippians 1.4 says we're always to pray for each other. Pray for the brethren. I hope you pray for each other daily. I hope you pray for this church daily. I hope you pray for our pastor and his family daily. Because you know what? Only that is going to bring us where we need to be. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. What's that mean? All the time. You know? Now, I don't believe God wants you to walk around all day long with your head up and going, Oh, Father, help my next step. Oh, Father, do this. Oh, Father, do, you know, come on. But I think that no matter what's going on in your life at any particular time, pray about it. Whatever's going on, whatever you need to do next, pray about it. Pray about anything and everything at all times. Because you know what? As I really tried to share with you tonight, anytime we proceed whatever we're doing with prayer, God hears us, and God will direct us. And when you're praying, you're worshiping. So you can be worshiping wherever you are by just simply uttering a prayer for whatever is on your mind. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and some of us may like this, some of us may not. Pray for those in authority every day. And, and I, I pray we will pray for those in authority every day. We may not like them. We may not be happy with what they do. But they have been put in authority. And the word says they've been put in authority by God. They represent those that can help us. And we need to pray for those folks daily. Because there we go. When we pray, by, with, with, when we pray for those in authority... God's going to equip them. God's going to equip them. Now, for just a moment, because I wanted to do this, this is for men only, this next little section here, guys. You ladies can listen. And that, that way you'll have something to tell him if he's not here tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. didn't look right, and that's because I'm in 2 Peter, okay? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Talking about our relationship, marital husband and wives, Peter shares, Likewise, ye husband, dwell with them, your wife, according to the knowledge, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. In other words, we're supposed to be stronger and help them. As being heirs together, we're equal, of the grace of life, God's grace is shed on us both. We're supposed to do all that with our wives, that your prayers be not hindered. 
So guys, if you want your prayers not to work, dishonor your wife. Mm. You ever think about that? If you want your prayers to be listened to and really answered, build your spouse up. Let her know how important she is. So, I've said all that to come to where we are to bring me to, the, to, bring me to tonight's sermon. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's going, wait, 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 what, what? I do want to share one more scripture with you because I want to share a couple of things. And it's from Acts chapter 12. And I'm going to begin in verse 5. And I think we probably all know this story, or most of us know this story. Peter's in jail. Uh, King Herod has had him arrested because he had just killed uh, James, the brother of John. And he was going to kill Peter because it made the Jewish hierarchy happy. So Peter's in jail, and he's uh, bound between these uh, guards. He's, it's just, there's no way he's getting out. He's done for. And verse 5 says, And Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So I want to, as I deal with this, I want to ask a couple of questions. And I want you to think about these because this little section I want to share now, I want you to understand that it is necessary for us to pray expectantly. And that is so, so terribly important. I know that we aren't supposed to tell stories and stuff mostly from the pulpit, but I heard a little story about this one time, and it's kind of cute, and I want to share it with you. Maybe by this time in this message, you can use a little bit of a laugh. story told of a preacher who was going to have a garden party, and he was inviting all the ladies of the church to this garden party, and he, he sent out special invitations to all the ladies, and please come, and it's important, and I'd love to have you come. Well, he inadvertently left out one lady, and she was a pillar of the church. Well, I mean, she was there every time the doors were open. And, of course, she got word of the garden party. And he was checking his list the day of the party, make sure he made sure he'd gotten everybody, and he realized, oh, my goodness, I forgot Mrs. So-and-so. So he calls her, and he says, Mrs. So-and-so, this is Pastor So-and-so, and I'm having a party for the ladies of the church today, and I really just inadvertently missed your name, and I feel so terrible, and I wanted to call you and give you a special invitation to come to the garden party. And she said, oh, pastor, it's too late. And he said, no, 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 it's still a little time before the party is. She said, oh, you don't understand. I've already prayed for rain. <laughs> Pray expectantly, guys. Pray expectantly. Interesting. Herod sends forth to verse 6 of Acts chapter 12. Herod, Herod sends forth to get Peter brought out of the jail, and he's not there. God had released him. And so I, I thought as this, I thought, wonder why some of the things we don't pray expectantly. And I think one of them is we're afraid God won't answer. Sometimes we would pray for something that we would really desire and really need and we would want to do it expectantly. But, you know, is God really going to answer this? Is God really going to do that? And you know what? Only God can answer the impossible. Only God can answer the impossible. We need to pray expecting the impossible to be answered. God can change things. God can change things. I think sometimes we don't pray expectantly because we're afraid the answer won't be exactly what we want. You ever done that? Pray about something and go, boy, I hope God answered it just the way I want it answered. Well, probably not going to happen. I tell you this. Anytime we're praying for something and we're praying expectantly, we need to pray the way Jesus did, expecting the answer to that prayer to bring glory to the Father, whatever it is. Because if we're asking God to do something for us and it'll bring glory to the Father, it's probably going to happen. It's probably going to happen. Just 
let God take over. I love this story in Acts because as you go down through it, uh, Peter's been, been released. The angels have brought him out of the prison. And when, he's, when he knows who he is and where he is and what's going on, he goes to where the, where the people are, where the, the followers of Christ are. Verse 12 said, when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Fantastic. Now, they were praying, and, and you would think they would have been praying expectantly, but you know the rest of the story? Peter goes up to the door, and he knocks on the door. This little girl comes out, opens the door, looks at him, oh, my goodness, slams the door right in his face, leaves him standing there. <laughs> Runs back inside and says, Peter's outside in the door. And the church, the people who were there praying, said, well, no, you don't understand. Peter's in jail. That's why we're here praying, is we want him released. I'm going, wait a minute. How does this not compute? <laughs> and I love it. It says here uh, in verse 16 in, in King James, it says, but Peter continued knocking. Poor old Peter still standing out there beating on the door saying, hey, your prayers are answered. Here I am. Sometimes our prayers are answered. We may not even recognize it. But Jesus shows us what's right and takes care of us. And the only other thing I think that we don't pray expectantly is because according to James book of James in uh, chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 it says we ask because we ask amiss and we don't have because we ask amiss because we ask for the things that are we think are important for what we need how many know the things that are important? God already knows what we need. Every one of us. Let me just read that scripture, James 4. Verses 2 and 3. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war and you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Guys, when we pray, and I'm hoping that this church is turning the corner to becoming an absolutely praying church, I am hoping that everything we do is absolutely bathed in prayer before we even think about coming through the door. I am so convinced that if every one of us, before every worship service, before we ever hit that parking lot, had this congregation prayed up that things would absolutely be better than we've ever thought they could be. I am so convinced that that is where the answer lies, is praying, not on what we want, not on our desires and lusts, but on what God wants, on what God's desires are and where God wants us to go as a, as a congregation and as a family. I am so convinced of that that, in my opinion, Monday night ought to be overflowing. It ought to be just standing room only. Oh, I wonder what God would do if that happened. I wonder what God would do if we really began, became a praying people. All the time, about everything, expecting it to happen. Expecting God to do great things. Expecting miracles. Expecting people to get saved. Expecting people to come. Expecting finances to be taken care of. What would happen if we prayed that way every day? Any time revolution came to our mind. Wow. So I thank you for bearing with me. I, I told Moses going into this that this is something I am passionate about. It's just so important. It's just so important we realize as, as family what it means to come together and to lift up 
each other, this church, this community, and this world in prayer. Because our Lord will listen, he will honor, and he will bless. Pray with me, please. Father God, I always feel inadequate. Lord, I just pray that your word goes out, and it goes out challenging, and it goes out blessing. Father, I, I'll be the first to, con to admit I don't really know that I completely understand prayer. I don't know how it touches your heart, but I know it does. And I know our Savior Jesus taught us to pray. And I know he prays for us. And I know, Lord, we're to pray for each other and we're to pray for this congregation and we're to pray for this, the work at this place. And so, Lord, I just want to continue to lift that up to you. Father, let us be a church, a congregation that is constantly in prayer. Lord, every once in a while we pick somebody out and we say, that's a prayer warrior. And there are those. But Lord, I pray we'd all be prayer warriors. That it, anytime somebody said something about this body of believers, the reputation would be they pray. They pray for each other. They pray for this community. They pray the love of Christ will go forth at all times. And Lord, let us give you all honor, glory, and praise as you answer those prayers. And Father, as you build this family and this community and this place. Father, I don't know how we're doing offering tonight, but I do know that people will give and so, Lord, I'm just going to ask that uh, if no, given no other way, let's let people come forward or let them give online or let them give in the boxes, however, Lord. Because, Lord, we know that we have to be faithful stewards of what you give. And, Lord, we know that you will bless us as you see fit. Lord, I bless, ask you to bless those that can give as well as those that can't give. And Lord, I just pray that you would honor what we do. I pray, Lord, that we will be blessed as you have blessed us and we'll be blessings to other people. Thank you, dear Lord, for the power and the privilege of prayer. Thank you, dear Lord, for all that have gathered tonight in your name. Thank you, dear Lord for preparing this place for us. And Lord, let us be a beacon of light into this community and into all of the area that you have placed us. We love you, Jesus. I thank you for each and every person that is here. And I pray as we go from here tonight, Lord, we'll go rejoicing that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord together. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. <laughs>